Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is Mr. Marty Morgan. He is the author of the book Down to Earth, which is a history of the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment in Normandy. And it's a, a fascinating story. Marty and I were talking before we hit record on this that the 507th really doesn't get as much discussion in the histories as the more storied regiments, particularly the 505th. So we wanted to have Marty on today to kind of rectify that situation. So Marty, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. It's always a pleasure to talk about the 507. Fantastic. Let me let me start with the book real quick. This is not, it's currently out of print, is it not? That's right. But you can find it on Amazon. I got this one off of eBay on a really good deal. And this is, it's not a particularly thick book, but I have never seen a regimental history that, and I'm not just trying to shine light on you, Marty, that was so well done. It's got so many photographs. You know, it's got so many different maps. It's got so many different discussions of equipment. This is a great picture right here of a, uh, a company okay. size 60 millimeter mortar. It's yeah. just got, you, you name it. If you wanna know something about the regiment from its inception, I wanna say in 43 through Normandy because the focus on the book is in Normandy although the regiment went to go on to do other great things and we'll talk about that too. This is just, it, it is so well done. And my question for you Marty is what was your motivation to explore the 507th in such depth? It's really a series of strange coincidences. So I had um, finished my, well, I not finished it, but I had completed a master's degree in history in 1996 and moved around a little bit and ended up in New Orleans. And after moving to New Orleans, I took a job working at a, a museum located in the city. Uh, as a complete coincidence, one day um, a call came in to where there was a person that wanted to speak to somebody in museum management. And uh, the person wanted to talk to that person about the 507th. And I knew absolutely nothing about the 507th. I didn't even know what it was. And I ended up uh, drawing the short straw to meet with this person because the person was coming in on a weekend. And so um, I walked over to the museum. I used to live right next to the museum when I worked there. And I walked over on a Sunday morning to meet with this guy. And the guy was kind of a persistent personality. He kept uh, kept calling the museum, trying to get a, an appointment with the museum president. The museum president just wouldn't do it. He finally went through this VIP tour company that attempted effectively to bribe the museum president into a meeting with this guy. And that didn't even work because the museum president didn't want to come in on a Sunday. Because I lived next door, he asked me to do it. I went in and, and as soon as I walked up to the guy he was with, a person that I knew from where I'm from, which is Birmingham. And the coincidence that began with that, it turns out that the person that was with him from Birmingham, um, who is now no longer alive, he was um, the, he led the church where I worked for a few years when I was in grad school. And so I already knew him. And it turns out that the person that was with him, the driving force, the persistent personality was a man named Bud Parker. And Bud Parker had, was, Bob Ray's son-in-law, Bob Ray, who would ultimately earn, who, Bob Ray, who earned the Distinguished Service Cross on the Lafayette Causeway in the Battle of June 9th, 1944. And this person, Mr. Parker, his son-in-law, wanted to do something about the 507th. And he kind of didn't know where to begin. He was prior service, but he was, it was a naval officer. He wanted to do something to remember the 507th, mainly because of the fact that he had taken a trip to Normandy in 1996. He had a hard time even finding Lafayette, which is the place where his father-in-law had earned the Distinguished Service Cross. And he found that there were effectively no memorials or markers there. You're probably familiar with the Iron Mike Memorial that's right there at Lafayette. And the Iron Mike Memorial, when the association put the memorial together, I have heard conflicting stories that some people say that the 82nd Airborne Division Association didn't even ask the 507th if they wanted to submit a plaque to go on the memorial there. Because was, as you walk up to the Iron Mike statue, there's an area where there's a low wall that has plaques on it. Like one is to Charles de Glopper from 325th Glider Infantry, one's to 81st anti-aircraft or airborne anti-aircraft, one's to 505, one's to 508. And then there are some blank spaces where there could have been more plaques and there's nothing even mentioning the 507th. Some of the old timers in the 507 said, ah, that's because they never really welcomed us in the division anyway. And then some of them said, well, it's, we, we were not really a true uh, a 
properly functioning association. And they reached out to us, but we just couldn't get it together in time to meet their deadline. Whatever the, whatever the case was, this, this man, Bob, Bob, Mr. Mr. Parker, he went to Normandy in 1996. There was not a word that the 507th had even fought there. He was a successful person in life and he had some resources at his fingertips and he decided he wanted to do something about it. And he didn't even know where to begin. So he, re he started reaching out to people and he reached out to the museum where I, where I worked, hoping for a meeting with the president and he got me, which was basically a consolation prize. <laughs> and by, by just complete coincidence, I knew the person he was traveling with. I knew we, through an extended um, family of friends, we had a lot of points of contact where we were aware of each other. And it began my relationship with the 507th right then and there. As I began talking with this man, uh, he eventually made this decision that he wanted to, to, he wanted to establish a memorial dedicated to the 507th in Normandy. And I was involved with helping him to do that. Uh, maybe you've been to the memorial. It's, it's, it's on the other side, the western side of the Meteray and the area around Lafayette and Coquigny. Um, it's kind of close to Omfreville. It's at a place called Les Elpiquets. And uh, I was involved in some of the legal work to help him get that memorial done. Um, then I also did some site work before the memorial went under construction and I helped him a little bit with some of that. And then eventually, well, there was a dedication for the memorial. That dedication took place on July 22nd 2002. The date is, is important because July 22nd, 1942 is the date at which the 507th was activated at Fort Benning. And so on July 22nd, 2002, we had a memorial service where we dedicated the 507th memorial. And it was, I look back on it now, I, when I lived through it, I didn't think it would be such a meaningful moment in my life. And it turned out to be uh, because there were 65 living veterans of the 507th physically present for the dedication to include three recipients of the Distinguished Service Cross who sat That's there. Amazing. It was absolutely amazing. It was, I look back at it, I look back at it now and, and it's, it was a magical moment. And um, with each year I get beyond it. I mean, I'm almost, we're almost at 20 years now. Um, I look back on it going, God, I can't believe that I stood in one place where um, all of these veterans assembled on what was for most of them their last visit. And I would mention this footnote because it's kind of important. And that is that the having the opportunity to be around those veterans basically made it possible for me to write the book because I began interviewing them. During that trip, I interviewed all 65 of them. That became the core data set that goes into the book. Um, and interestingly, um, in, on December 6th, the last of those veterans passed away. It was a man named, yeah, yeah, a man named John Hinchliffe, who was a machine gunner in headquarters company, 3rd Battalion, who fought during the battle at Glen. And um, he, when he passed away in December, he died as a result of complications from the coronavirus. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so that's a big, that's a big milestone. That's, that's what brought me into the, into first being involved, but then something else happened that's kind of important. When I worked at the museum, I was working around and having regular interactions with the late Stephen Ambrose, who many people have heard of, and they're familiar with him, I think, the most because of the fact that he wrote a book called Band of Brothers. But I, in working with Dr. Ambrose, was around him frequently. And uh, after his death, I managed his collection of research material that included a large number of oral histories. He collected the oral histories for his big thick book. You may have seen it. It's called D-Day, The Climactic Battle of World War II. Came out for the 50th anniversary of D-Day. And Dr. Ambrose communicated with about 1,200 veterans in the preparation of that book. He didn't have a, lot, a great deal of direct interaction with all of them. He directly interacted with about 100 of them. But then he had indirect interactions with the rest of them. And that was through questionnaires that they filled out. Kind of, he just he literally just followed the model that Cornelius Ryan had used for writing the longest day. And so Dr. Ambrose sent questionnaires out. He reviewed the questionnaires, and some people he reached out to and he talked to, and they became a bigger part of the narrative of that book. And one of the people that he interacted with quite a lot was uh, a now deceased um, officer from the 507th named Roy Creek, who you've probably heard of. And Roy Creek and uh, Roy Creek commanded E Company 507. And Roy Creek uh, was decorated for what he did at Chef de Pont during the invasion. 
And during the, the trip in 2002 to dedicate the memorial, um, I spent a lot of time around Colonel Creek and I got to know him really well. And he knew that I worked at the museum, that I worked around and was near. I wasn't right next to Ambrose all the time, but I was within an inner circle that was near Stephen Ambrose. And he told me at the end of that trip um, in July 2002, he told me, hey, like, hey, please tell Stephen Ambrose that I said hi next time you see him. So I traveled home from that trip. It was at the end of July 2002. I, because I was gone for about 10 days on the trip, I was trying to get caught up with a lot of work that I missed while I was overseas. And I was in the museum on a Sunday afternoon because I lived literally across the street from the museum. It was very easy for me to do that. I slid in on a Sunday to try to get some work done. And I, you could always tell when Stephen Ambrose was in the building because you could smell him because you could smell the cigarette smoke. <laughs> it was, no one could smoke in the building. And if anybody else tried to smoke in that building, they would have been tarred and feathered. No one would say a word to Stephen Ambrose when he would smoke in the building. And so Dr. Ambrose would come in and he would go lock himself in his office and he'd light up and smoke. And so I was sitting at my desk on a Sunday morning and um, I, it was August 2002 and I could smell cigarette smoke and I was like, ah, he's here. And I was like, I'm going to go speak to him. I got up from my desk and by the time I walked around the corner, we had an elevator to get to the fourth floor of the building and Ambrose was waiting for the elevator and I automatically knew, all right, you got to make this quick. You only have a minute. And I said, Dr. Ambrose, I just wanted to let you know that um, I just got back from Europe, back, just back, got back from Normandy and Roy Creek told me to tell you hello. And he just lit up and he was like, oh my God, how's Roy Creek doing? And I was like, he's doing great. He was like, why were you over there with him? I said, just dedicated a memorial to the 507th. And he said, you know what? nobody's ever really documented the 507th that well because you know they were only part of the 82nd Airborne Division for Normandy. And I was like, yeah, I know that now. And he said, yeah, somebody needs to write a book about that. He said, so did you interview, how many veterans did you have? I said, we had 65 veterans on the, on the trip. He said, did you interview any of them? And I said, I interviewed all of them. And Ambrose went, you need to write that book. The elevator <laughs> went, bing, the door opened. He got on the elevator and off he went. And I was like, whatever, I am not writing a book. I had written a master's degree thesis and that almost killed me. And I remember thinking that's not gonna happen. Two months after that, I was in on another Sunday um, and I walked into the museum early enough cause I, I had to work that Sunday. I went in early at like 8 a.m. And I went to my computer, turned it on. And the first thing I saw was Stephen Ambrose dead, age 69. And it was at that point that I realized, well, I have to write that book. So yes, I did. Sir. <laughs> that's an amazing tale. That, that's a that's a great way to kick this off. <laughs> that's fantastic. So I don't, I, I'm not sure. I don't want to insult my listeners, the viewers, but I don't think we need to go through a, a whole history of hey, they, you know, they formed in '42, they trained stateside. Pretty much every one of my guys and most of the folks who watch this show, they kind of understand how a parachute infantry regiment was trained. The the big question is, how did the, how did the 507th and I know, I know you know this kind of lead into it. How did they wind up incorporated into the division for the jump into Normandy? That, that, that's, that's kind of the, sh yeah. the question on everyone's mind. And that's the oddity of this story, isn't it, though? Um, it was because of divisional attrition. The, by the time that the division it moves from Italy to England in preparation for Operation Neptune, uh, the division had seen some combat from Sicily. I'm sure you're well aware of just how things went things went right and things went also kind of wrong in Sicily. And then the division gets deployed into the Salerno beachhead during Operation Avalanche. And then you don't get the entire division that becomes a, a part of Operation Shingle, which is the Anzio, Anzio landings, but you get elements of the division, particularly 504th gets fed into the beachhead at Anzio and 504th therefore experiences a great deal of attrition as a result of that. And in fact, when the rest of the division was moved back to England to prepare for D-Day, 504th was still committed and in combat around the Anzio, Anzio beachhead. And by the time that the 504th was extracted from that experience, um, they assessed the attrition that the regiment had suffered fighting in Italy. And the, the decision was made that they had just, they had lost too much. And rather than throw a whole bunch of of replacement troops into the regiment and then hustle it back to England so it could jump into, into Normandy, the decision was made to use one of the new regiments that have just arrived. So the 507th had just completed a, a period of about a year training in Box Butte County, Nebraska, near the at the town of Alliance. 
and they got shipped overseas. They reached England, and it was only upon reaching England that they were assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division to be a temporary replacement for the 504th. Well, there we go. And the rest is history, as they said. <laughs> and the rest is history, yeah. <laughs> And that's why in the, in the aftermath of the war, when the division writes its history, the division really didn't have to tell the whole story of the 507th because the 507th, well, the 507th part of its history belongs to the 82nd, and then part of it belongs to the 17th Airborne Division. And so yes, the 80, I, some of the veterans had a little bit of an ax to grind, like, ah, the 82nd never really welcomed us. They never really considered us a part of the division. I was like, yeah, because you went to another division eventually, <laughs> and became a part of that division's history. And so it's, it sort of makes sense that they only told your side of, of the story as it related to the Normandy operation. And so that's, I think, part of the reason why Dr. Ambrose was like, somebody needs to tell that story one of these days. And I uh, just wish he had survived long enough to be the person to tell that story, because a lot more people would have read the story if he had written it. I imagine, though, and I, and I could be way off base about this, but I think the absolutely pioneering work that he did, not only with Band of Brothers, but with Pegasus Bridge. And as you said, he wrote that fantastic book about D-Day and then followed it up with Citizen Soldiers. You had a, a popular history about World War II that probably really fired a lot of imagination. Then you get guys going, well, I need, to, I need to learn more. I need to dig into different things. And then you have a book like, you know, Down to Earth that comes out that probably met that need. I imagine that it was kind of a, a second generation, if you will, uh, interpretation of the history of, of airborne in world war ii and so I, I even though he didn't get the opportunity to maybe document the regiment itself he, he paved the way for you to to be able to get this in, into people's hands and it, at a time when it, it might have been a popular reception for it yeah he created job opportunities and <laughs> there are lots of us that have benefited from the work that he did it, it's been interesting over the years because a lot of people are have turned a little negative toward him but I remember well, I was in grad school. I started my master's degree in history in um, 1992 and I completed it in 1996. And I remember what it was like before Band of Brothers, D-Day, the climactic battle of World War II and Citizen Soldiers. All three of those books came out while I was in graduate school. And I went batshit crazy over those books. I loved them. and the reality of my master's degree experience was that um, my department had done what a lot of departments were doing. And that is that my department had become very heavy on, they had taken the, the idea of the liberal arts college a little too seriously. And my department was um, entering into the postmodern era in that there was not much of an emph emphasis on military history there were, in fact, there was a barely recognizable interest in it within the department. There was not much of an interest in talking about World War II history or World War I history or Civil War history. We had a few faculty members in the department that those, they, and they were faculty, they were older faculty members. So that in like 1992, they were people that were within a decade of retiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had completed their PhD credentials in the you know, maybe late 50s, early 60s, maybe mid to late 60s. So they were people that they were nearing the end of a career that had started at a time when America was quite a bit different than it was in the 90s, quite a bit different than it is now. And so I had, I was lucky enough to have a mentor named Dr. James Tent. He's still alive. He ultimately became the, the head of my department. And Dr. Tent was very interested in World War II history. Um, I worked with a professor named Harriet Armbrester, who lived and breathed the Civil War, and I was thankful for that because that's a subject that interests me as well. Dr. Tent was also interested in World War I history and German history, and these are the things that kind of um, pulled me up on the deck. These are the things that, you know, made me realize, I don't think I want to be a history major, and then I became one. And as I moved into the, to the master's degree experience, I was finding that there was I'm trying to put this very diplomatically because I don't want to come across as a ranting, raving person, but so, uh, they, they had embraced postmodernism post -modernism to the extent that they were attempting to push me away from what they called traditionalists, the, the traditionalist school. They wanted to push me away from traditional military history, and I had members of my committee that really wanted me to study labor history and feminist history, and those are all extremely important subjects. 
And there are subjects that I'm still very interested in, but first and foremost, I'm interested in military history. First and foremost, I'm interested in the American experience in the Second World War. And because of the weird sequence of events that were set up for me by other people to include the son-in-law of Bob Ray and Stephen Ambrose, I ended up getting very interested in airborne history. Uh, but when I started the master's degree program, there was a little bit of hostility to the idea of studying traditional old military history. And it was, I remember them talking about it as that is something that people used to do. It was very much as this is a thing that belonged to the past. Keep in mind, I'm working on my master's degree during the 50th anniversary of D-Day. And the, I remember the way that it all changed in the wild, the way that it all became very dynamic um, very clearly because I was reading a lot of assigned work that works that were about cultural interpretations of the of the um, the French Revolution, and I was doing a lot of work on labor history, and again, those are extremely important subjects, and I'm very interested in them, but they just weren't my emphasis. And then, bam, Ambrose kicks in the door in 1994 with that big thick book about D-Day, and it changed everything. It changed everything. Before that, my department was really on this course toward postmodernism. Um, the course that we see fully realized today with the people that are looking at things like critical race theory and, um, and grievance studies, things like that, not to discredit them or take anything away from them, but that's just not what I was interested in. And it's not what I, I was doing. And my department was very much like that. It was to the point that um, one, of the, one of the people on my committee who was an excellent historian, she would always tease me and she called me guns and boats. And she called me that because she'd say, if it doesn't have guns or boats in it, he's not interested in it. And she wasn't wrong. And <laughs> she ended up being the head of the department and I still communicate with her. And she's very supportive of what I've ended up doing. Even though when I was very young, she actively attempted to push me away from the subject. The, my email address to this very day is midway512 at Yahoo. And, <laughs> and it's because there was a long period of time there where I lived and breathed the history of the Battle of Midway. And when I started my master's program, uh, she asked me, what are you interested in studying? And I was like, I'm really interested in Midway. And she said to me in 1992, what, why are you interested in that? Everything that could possibly be said about it has already been said. That has been proven wrong by yeah, before the, the seminal book on the subject came out. Before Shattuck Court, <laughs> I mean that was before Tony Tully and John Parshall changed everything, and because that book came out in '96, I think, yes, and that book changed everything about Midway, and it's an absolutely excellent piece of scholarship, and it fascinated me to because to the to the person that's really a postmodernist, and that historian, she was very very much interested in cultural history, labor history, and feminist history. And um, she was kind of trying to push me towards that because those were her areas of interest and those, those were her areas, areas of strength. And those are fascinating areas. She roped me in, she got me very interested in those subject areas, but man, I'm, I was guns and boats. I wanted to talk about World War I, World War II, Civil War, Spanish American War. Those are the things I was really interested in. And the, the department was just, was kind of like scowling toward those ideas. And then 1994 happened. And Band of Brothers had already come out and Band of Brothers started a ripple. Then the Big Thick D-Day book came out and that ripple got bigger. And then Citizen Soldier came out right as I was graduating. And it just, all those three books just in, you know, a short pace of time reoriented, I feel like a national um, emphasis on the history of the Second World War. There was already um, a little bit of a pivot taking place where people were beginning to memorialize World War II more than they were criticizing it because there was a period that I think was just completely influenced by the post-Vietnam era in American history where it was fashionable to be cynical. It was very fashionable to be disenchanted with the American vision. And the scholarship reflects that. It reflects that very powerfully. And that is up until the point where Ambrose always said that it was Brokaw and his book, The Greatest Generation. Um, but I really think it was Ambrose himself that made a big, he influenced a big change uh, to use the, the term sea change. I mean, the, literally everything changed because of the work that Ambrose did. And while there are plenty of people out there that kind of to this day snarl when they hear his name and they're critical of him, he, he had an impact that gay has given me this thing that I've called a career 
And there are a lot of other people that are continuing the work that he does. And there are a lot of people that I have watched it unfold. That's been a weird thing of the perspective of this career that I've had is having gone from the era before 94 when there was some direct hostility toward traditionalism, how 94 changed it, the popularity began to swell upwards and it reached this peak. Private Ryan happened, Band of Brothers, the series happened and the world just embraced the subject. And in many ways, the world still can't get enough of it. I mean, for God's sake, Band of Brothers, the series was 20 years ago and those actors still have people that won't leave them alone for these you roles see, that they played in a series 20 years ago. You see stuff on Facebook still, there's groups dedicated to collecting their memorabilia. It's fantastic. I mean, it, and I can't say I'm not a fanboy. I'm sitting here with my box set, you know. There it is. Fanboy, <laughs> there it so. is. <laughs> so you, we all you love take, it though, don't we? We all we sure do. And you've taken- what's, you take, what, what's your favorite episode? Episode six. Nice That's choice. Nice. <laughs> Very nice choice. I'm 100% with you on that. A lot of people just throw episode two out and I'm like, six is kick ass. It really six is. It's so great. I, it's I got the opportunity. Go ahead, Mario. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's perfectly paced storytelling. I mean, the, those actors all did such amazing jobs and they made you care. The storytelling made you care. The cinematography made you care. There was just such a commitment to that. And I don't know that we're going to see something like that ever again. I hope we do, but I don't know that we will. But I still just, I, I can't pass on an opportunity to sit through episode six. I love it. I agreed. Agreed. I had the opportunity to interview Doc Rowe's grandson a few episodes back. And that, that, was, that was a huge, uh, huge treat. And uh, Chris mm -hmm. and I, I count Chris uh, Langlois, that's his name. We are Chris. good friends now. So he's no, a great no, dude. He is <laughs> he's a so cop. You gotta love him. In a big way. He's, he's a 100% dyed blue, that's for sure. The, uh, you've taken the conversation in a couple different directions and a bunch of stuff I want to acknowledge, and this is awesome. So I, I think it's interesting when you talk about Dr. Ambrose's reputation, how he's maybe taken a couple hits. I don't think somebody can, especially a professional academic historian the way he was, who can then succeed so wildly in the popular realm. I don't see how you can become that popular. You know, you know name a professional academic historian. Everyone's going to probably go to Ambrose if they know anyone at all. I, I don't see how you, you can not take hits when you've grown that big, especially when people who have probably worked equally as hard and done equally good work, uh, but because of what they're, they're focused on, they didn't, they didn't hit that, that shift in, you know, history, interest in history, the way Dr. Ambrose was able to, they, you might just wind up feeling a little slighted, but I, I, I just can't imagine that you can be as big as he became and not attract some negative attention along with all the accolades. I think it just goes with the territory. It is inevitable. There's no doubt about it. And I love to point out because I find myself frequently being his most vocal critic and his most vocal defender because I'm, and I think if he was still alive today, he would listen to every word of criticism that I have because I'm not attacking his person and I'm not attacking his character, but I'm attacking things that he said that were wrong. And there's a lot that we learned of things that he put in all of the books that we now know weren't entirely true. And I think he would welcome every bit of that. The thing that he didn't like, I can tell you, was the fact that people came at him almost as if he had become a U.S. senator overnight. They, it was all ad hominem personal attacks about his character that ultimately, um, it ultimately reached this level where it became the plagiarism controversy and the plagiarism accusation. And he wasn't entirely guilty of what everyone charged him of being in that, I think, in the way that the country loves to um, take down senators, take down politicians. They, they engaged in a takedown. They went in a, in a takedown. And I just love to point out the fact that before he had contracts with Simon and Schuster, nobody had a negative word to say about him. <laughs> well, then go. he got to where he was landing the big book contracts. And I feel him on that because I'm very much in this weird world now where I can't get publishers to do a thing with me. The, granted, the world's a lot different in 2021 than it was in the 1990s when it comes to publishing, but I have very much realized the way that the publishing world works. And that is that the more famous you are, the better it is to you. And it, it's like, if you wanna be a successful author, start by being famous. And that's, <laughs> that's a great start for becoming a successful author. And if you're not famous, well, you're, you're not gonna make it. I mean, I'm the living example of that. I've been trying hard now for over 20 years and I've effectively gotten nowhere. And I spent the stretch of time between Christmas 
2020 and New Year's 2021, working on a book proposal. And, um, and that book proposal, which ended up being a document that's almost 12,000 words in length, which okay. is like writing a book right there. And that's sure. just the proposal. Um, and I spent that time creating this proposal and it made me appreciate why people hated Ambrose. Because to tell you the truth, I hated him a little bit right then when I, spent, <laughs> I locked myself away for a week and all I did was try to consider different approaches to my storytelling and try to structure my, my proposal to be more, more coherent, more, co more coherent, to be slimmer and leaner and to be more direct and to, to talk more about character development and to dwell less on extraneous things like weapons and equipment, the things that I'm still interested in. Um, but I, that process, which for me was an agony to sit through and, you know, to suffer over during a week, um, I realized that this is what people have to go through when they're not somebody. When you're a nobody, you have to be so much more creative just to get attention. And it made me appreciate the fact that a lot of the people that spoke out against Ambrose when the plagiarism controversy came up, because there was a bit of a dog pile effect going on where sure. a bunch of people came out of the woodwork to go, yeah, I don't like him either. And I realized that because I know one of his last books, it wasn't his last book, but one of the last book was a really good book called The Wild Blue that was mainly about George McGovern and 376 Mabarmic Group flying missions out of Italy. Um, and it was a nice book. It was a really cool story. George McGovern was a, was a great guy. Um, the way that Ambrose pitched that to Simon and Schuster was not even a one page. It was a phone call. And that was a phone call that was a multi-million dollar advance on a book that they already knew it was going to be a bestseller. It was already, they knew it. And while I was suffering on like day five, of laboring over this book proposal just a few weeks ago, I remember thinking, man, it's just, why can't I have that? Why can't I just go, hey, I wanna write about this. Okay, great, click, and they send a check. But that's what Ambrose's life became. He suffered through 20 years, like, you know, like so many historians. He went 20 years of basically ex existing in oblivion. He, no one knew who he was. He was publishing regularly. He was contributing to scholarship on a regular basis. And it just so happened that his process of learning how to write for an academic world led him to then realize how to write for popular publication because they are two different animals, as you know. Yes, sir. They are not the same animal. Ambrose learned how to write and how to speak to people who are not academics. And I believe that that paved the way for his success. And once that success emerged. It began emerging with Pegasus Bridge followed by Band of Brothers, but it really emerged with the D-Day book. And with that being the situation, it was all, all about timing. It was, he was the right place at the right time. He was the right guy because he was living and breathing World War II history and military history, just like we do. Ike's official biographer for you. Know, it's like Ike's official biographer. And it's been interesting to me that, you know, the, the campaign to tarnish him has considered has continued after his death. Because you may have seen a few years ago, there were people that um, dug into what was existing in terms of diary and office records about President Eisenhower. And they, were, they provided some suggestions that maybe Ambrose had exaggerated the extent to which he had access to the president. And so there was this big gossipy palace intrigue that emerged. And all I could think was like, guys, he's been dead for eight years. By my, at that point, it was more than 10 years. He'd been dead for more than a decade. And they're still hammering, around, hammering away on his legacy. And I thought, that's how much, that's how people can be petty. You heard it here first. That's how <laughs> petty people can be. And, and it disappointed me to see that there were people that were ready to take a jab at, you know, somebody's, his, somebody's legacy. But, you know, I guess that's also par for the course, just like when senators get all appalled that people become criti critical of them, I always think like, brother, when you signed up, that's what you signed up for. And by that token, I believe Ambrose, he fully understood as, as his popularity began to broaden, I think he understood like, yeah, well, I'm sure it's gonna start happening for me. I'm gonna start to get some negatives. Um, I can testify to this. The negatives that he got were far, far beyond what he had expected. He did not expect someone to basically carve his living heart out 
by accusing him of plagiarism. And it's really something that he wasn't really truly guilty of. What, just to boil it down, because I've, I've had this prepared speech for almost 20 years now, since- You got a platform, so let's- Yeah, the, the, and I've, I've shortened it, it'll be mercifully quick. And that is that basically what happened with Ambrose and the plagiarism controversy was that he was writing for a popular press. He was writing for a publisher who did not want to contribute a lot of page real estate to hundreds of pages of footnotes. In other words, Simon & Schuster was saying, you know, listen, we want you to keep it brief because, you know, it's after all, at the end of the day, it is a product that's out there to make money. And the more cost that goes into that product, the less you get in profit. And Ambrose had in his previous writings, because he was an academic, he turned in basically academic format, format for citation, which were long, long form in notes. Simon and Schuster pressured him into short form footnotes, the type of the, the type that you get from popular nonfiction. And so he complied because, you know, they at the end of the day, it's it's their book. They're commissioning a book from you. They get to call the shots. And he got pressured into short form footnotes. And then a large number of academics scrutinized it as they would something that was submitted to an academic journal. And under that scrutiny, it just didn't stand up because after all, I mean, I think that I, I remember at one point hearing him say something like, um, uh, I think it was Bob Bender who was his editor at Simon & Schuster had said, uh, I, wanted, I want you to keep it as short as possible, like, you know, one footnote, one footnote, maybe two per page. But oh my goodness. You gotta keep it short because otherwise you could have 250 pages of text and 250 pages of notes. I mean, that's what academic nonfiction looks like. I don't have to say academic nonfiction. That's, <laughs> that's redundant. That's what, that's what academic works look like. And they were not, Sam and Schuster was not having that. They wanted it to be character driven. They wanted it to be engaging. They didn't want it to be pumped full of jargon. And the academic world is so bad about that. And they didn't want to spend the money on printing 250 pages of notes at the end of a nonfiction popular title. And so he turned in exactly what they wanted him to turn in. And then a bunch of academics basically threw the book at him for not fulfilling an academic obligation, which is not what he set out to do to begin with. It's absolutely amazing to hear about how the business of writing can affect the craft of writing, especially if you're transitioning from that academic background into working for a popular press. That's just, this is a cautionary tale for everybody out there who's looking to get a book deal. That's for sure. It, yeah, it sure is. And it's, <laughs> and it, I mean, the, the, the gatekeepers within that world, I get it. I see it from their side and I understand that they get bombarded by people that they constantly get unsolicited, man, unsolicited manuscripts and that people are constantly after them because People are coming to them, please make me a star and a millionaire. And they can't do that for everybody. And not everybody that comes to them is bringing them quality. That there are yes, a lot of people that bring them, you know, to be honest, crap. And they they have to become gatekeepers. I understand that from their perspective. But the fun, the big irony I had this week with my agent is that he, the proposal that I submitted that I've worked on over the holidays and then we've been shopping recently, it went to some of the bigger publishers and they turned it away on the basis of like, well, he doesn't have much in the way of sales. And I was like, yeah, because nobody, no publisher <laughs> allow, let me submit something. And of course I'm not going to have much in the way of sales. And it's the been, kid who can't get a job because he has no experience. Right, exactly. it's, precisely <laughs> that. it's precisely that. And, and that transition, that's a weird transition. I think it's a lot worse than it was in Ambrose's day now because of, you know, Hey, the obvious, you know, digital bull on the China shop. And that's changed everything. But at the same time, Ambrose transitioned from academic to, to popular. And that's not something you see people do much. Yes, sir. Rarely, rarely happens. <laughs> Very cool. Well, this was a, a, an awesome rabbit trail about Dr. Ambrose. This is like a, a special mm -hmm. treat that I, I'm definitely going to uh, promote when we get this thing posted on the, the YouTube channel. But let's get back to the 507. So we're- Back to the airport. We're in England on the eve of the invasion. And uh, for folks who are listening, if you could break down what the 507th objective was, because it's it's fascinating. You were talking about Colonel Creek earlier and you know the actions down near Chef de Pont, which is way south of Lafayette for folks who you know might be familiar with the topography. The 507th objective was nowhere near Chef de Pont. And it's just kind of cool uh, to hear what the mission was, 
how the operation unfolded and what the regiment actually wound up doing. So if you could kind of set that up for us. Yeah, the regiment was to infiltrate by parachute operation into a landing or drop zone that was just to the northwest of St. Mariglis and, you know, drop zone T, um, which was, as it turns out, within this realm of the flooded area of the Meridoray River. The regiment was to then assemble and move toward a series of blocking positions. They were to seize and hold crossings um, in conjunction with the 505th and the 508th, um, particularly the um, crossings on the west bank of the Meridoray River at Coquigny um, to protect the Lafayette Causeway. They were to then seize, occupy, and hold uh, areas in the vicinity of Empreville and Gubersville and wait for link up with um, the amphibious forces that landed on Utah Beach with the Seventh Corps. And as you know, most of that did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Now everyone realizes, when I say everyone, I, my audience is a bunch of hip kids. So they know that the, the airborne drops are scattered. And pretty much anyone who watched Band of Brothers knows that now too. But I, I would hazard to guess, and this is a completely non-academic stab in the dark, Probably no regiment was more widely scattered if you count from north to south than the 507th. I believe in your book you said it was over 60 square miles if you counted, uh, you know, from the furthest east and south to the guys who had dropped furthest to the north. So j just how badly scattered was was the regiment uh, when they actually exited the aircraft? 507th was the worst drop of anybody that night by far. Also, 507th was last, and so they had the effect of flying into a hornet's nest. An enemy who would by that point, 507 serials begin dropping around 2.38 a.m. And by the time that they arrived, the enemy had been aroused for over three hours because let's face it, you know, the old mythology is that the invasion was a surprise. The enemy knew we were coming before the sun set on June 5th. They just didn't exactly know where specifically, but they knew we were coming. And so the 507 flies in last. There's no really not much in the way of surprise at that stage. The 507th's drop was by far the worst out of uh, 202 sticks to end up on the drop zone. That is, that's, it's catastrophic. <laughs> yes, it's sir. I mean, well, and, 1 and, and, of your combat power in the vicinity of the objective. And just for the record, those were two of the Pathfinder teams too. So it's, I mean, an absolute catastrophe for the, for the regiment. And that the best, the best way I've come up with and now what's been you know, 18 something years of, to illustrate the point is that you had 507 serials that, you know, two came down on the drop zone. A large number of them came down within a ring about a mile around the drop zone. So they were off the DZ, but not that bad off. But then you get um, the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario are the 9C47s that drop the better part of headquarters company third battalion in the vicinity of Glen, 16 miles south of the drop zone. That's by far the worst drop of the entire invasion because you get some, you get some 501st serials that drop between uh, St. André du Bois and Graine, that area south of Carentan. You get them down there too, but their DZs were a lot closer than the 507th DZ. So 507th was really far off. The, the, the serials that drop around Graine, they're the worst. You also have some 507th guys that are north of the DZ, significantly north. I think the worst case scenario north of the drop zones, is there are a group of guys from, I believe, 505 that end up in the southern outskirts of Cherbourg. That's pretty bad, but that's not as bad as the nine C-47s that deposit Headquarters Company 3rd Battalion 507 in the, in the, area, in the, the area south of Carentan. Most 507 serials are about three to four miles from the drop zone. And as, as you know, this materially impedes the ability of the regiment to do what it is supposed to do. Yes, sir. It, uh, it interferes with the ability to assemble. So a couple quick questions dr driven by that. And this is just the, the headquarters company guys from 3rd Battalion. Is there any documented evidence of how long it took them to link up and, and get back with the regiment? Did, within the 33 days of combat, did they ever even make it back to the regiment or did they just wind up attaching to another unit and doing what they had to do? A little bit of both, actually. Um, for the most part, you end up with, you know, it's, a, it's over 150 507th Headquarters Company 3rd Battalion 507 troopers that um, end up at Klein. Most of them end up doing an exfil to the north, and they walk into the 101st Airborne D Division perimeter between 
June 12th and June 16th. So for the most of them, it's not that bad. You know, that, that's a story for another day, but, at the, <laughs> but the reality is that most of those men, that's a group of 150 and at least 130 of them end up, no, not 130, at least 120 of them end up working their way to the 101st and then there, and thereby joining the regiment and ultimately then being placed where they were supposed to be to begin with. They're the, in position by the time that the 507th is preparing for uh, the larger attack toward uh, Haye de Puy that occurs later in June, pushing into the, to the July timeframe. However, there are 507th paratroopers that um, end up separated from that main body. It's kind of hard to call it a main body because Headquarters Company 3rd Battalion basically breaks into two groups. One's about 80 men, one's about 25 men, and those are they eventually join into one group, and that I consider the main body that works its way out to Carantan. There were some outliers that managed to be left behind by that, the two main bodies that then eventually became one main body. And there are examples um, that are very, very hard to document of some of those guys that I think were still down there when the second armored division moved into that area and liberated oh, wow. it. Yeah, and by the time that that happens, that's late July, and the 507th is no longer in France. Yes, sir. That's amazing. That, that would that would be an interesting rabbit trail to go down if you could find somebody who could talk to that. That's for sure. Yeah, I have theories on a couple of guys, and th those are. And of course, now the big problem is they're all gone. Everybody's gone. Yes, sir. There are still a few 507th veterans alive, and, but they're veterans that belong to the later history of the regiment, Battle of the Bulge, Operation Varsity. Yes, sir. Um, all of the 507th veterans that participated in the Normandy campaign are gone now. That 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 era ended in December with the death of oh, John Hinchcliffe. So glad you're able to document as many stories as you were able to. So we've got the regiment spread out. Obviously, you, you've articulated that very well. And everyone knows the rule of LGOPs, little groups of paratroopers. You know, get together with a couple of your buddies, move to the sound of the guns, kill anyone not dressed like you. And a, pro a lot of that was probably already starting to happen. Was there a point where enough combat power by the regiment was assembled that they could actually start going after regimental objectives? Or were they just hitting whatever they could find and falling in with whomever they could? It, was there a point where the regiment was considered, okay, you guys are a combat effective regimental body of troops again that can be assigned objectives under your own leadership? Or were they just so widely scattered they just got in where they fit in? You know, strangely, that's a little bit of both on those two counts too, in an interesting way, because the, the regiment was kind of, it was treated um, whether they liked it or not, it was treated as a regiment um, as of about, well, certainly as of the attack toward La Bonneville on June 12th, June 11th and 12th. Um, it was not a regiment at that point, but it was being treated like one by the division. And what you see them in that time period is that you're seeing effectively um, battalion actions where they're, they're attacking, keep in mind that this is a regiment, but they're attacking two battalions up and there's no reserve battalion. It's really, they're putting two battalions up on the line and then there's a regimental headquarters. And so it's a little bit of a shell of what it's supposed to be. Certainly. And then eventually they get this, this consignment of men that shows up after the fact, the, the headquarters company through battalion men that eventually arrive. Um, and they're, they're, fully, um, they're fully absorbed into the regiment, the regiment um, by June 16th. So they missed out on parts of the, the Le Bonneville action, action and then the push toward this little, they call it a village, but my God, it's Normandy. It's a crossroads with a couple of houses. It's called <laughs> Franck, a place called Franck with Tolt, where they're um, in a coherent way um, functioning as a, re a regiment, although what it looks like is a regiment that's composed of two battalions. And that's the way they function um, all the way up until the big, uh, push toward Hill 90, the hit, the push toward Haye de Puy, um, and that drive where uh, some of the men that are famous from actions between June 6th and June 9th, where they end up becoming casualties during the big assault there, that kind of culminates with their experience right before the 4th of July, where the regiment gets shot to pieces um, on what's called Le Bonneville Ridge, not Le Bonneville, uh, um, What's the ridge called? I'm, I'm thinking of it in a minute, Hill 90. Uh, but the regiment gets shot to pieces. And 
in the aftermath of that attack, the, the regiment is pulled back to Utah Beach to an assembly area where everyone was supposed, was forced to turn in their uniforms and they burned them. So everybody, not everybody, almost all jumpsuits were burned in a big pile near Utah Beach, second week of July, and then eventually loaded them up on LSTs and sent them back to England. Now, there was a change in regimental leadership about that time, was it not, between Colonel Millett and Colonel Raft? Did that occur during the campaign? Uh, it did. It occurred immediately, in fact, because Colonel Millett um, disappears the night, well, I should say pre-dawn on June 6th. And that is there. I, and in the book, I have a couple of accounts to include Paul Smith, who ultimately becomes a general officer. Um, Paul Smith was around and there was one big column that everyone was attempting to move. And this is pre-dawn June 6th. And the column ends up getting separated because every time they'd stop, people would fall asleep. Imagine that. I'm sure that, I think that's an experience you may have lived yourself. Yes, sir. <laughs> on, on night jumps where everyone is just absolutely worn out and you stop and everybody nods off. And so because of that, a, a column got separated. Colonel Millett was at the head of that column and that column walked right up on the enemy and he, a bunch of them get shot up and he gets captured. And so Colonel Millett ends up spending the rest of the war as a prisoner of war. And that's June 6th. What, how about that for the a great start to your operation? <laughs> your regimental commander has been captured and it's not even sunrise. Um, and that's the point at which uh, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Maloney takes over. Colonel Maloney begins commanding the regiment and commands it through the critical moment uh, during the Battle of Lafayette. And to go back to that question you asked a second ago about um, coherent organization of the regiment and what Maloney ends up having at Lafayette fascinates me because you may have heard about it, but what he ended up doing is he, had, he didn't have coherent companies and battalions that were reporting in. And he had to basically just take a rabble of men from some of them being headquarters types, some of them being infantry guys, and he had to assemble them into something that looked like a regiment. And the best he could do during the first few days were three what they called composite companies. That's all he could manage to assemble. And he put three men in command of them, and that was Morgan A. Brockenack, Bob Ray, and then Roy Creek. And so you had, and so Colonel Maloney, when he was interacting with General Gavin at Lafayette, it fascinates me that what he had to report in, it was like, this is all I got. This is all I have, General. And so he was like, all right, place Company Creek here, Company Ray here, and Company Brockenack here. And that's why you end up with the oddity of, as things begin to go wrong in the June 9th attack, as elements of 325th really get hammered on the causeway, it's time to begin sending in a reserve force. And that's why it fell to the first company that Colonel Maloney had set aside as the reserve element because General Gavin was really left with no recourse. He was like, I'm gonna call you my reserve element. You're my reserve regiment, even though his reserve regiment was three composite companies that were under strength. Yeah, and like isn't battalion it, minus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Battalion minus. I mean, and isn't it fascinating to think that that's that's an everything that can go wrong has gone wrong scenario, and look what they still did. Yes, sir. I mean, that's that's a that's a touchstone to the division, so to speak. And every, everyone knows what happened at Lafayette in terms of. And I say this with no disrespect. In terms of the mythology, almost the. I, when you try to you know you read Robert Murphy's account, you read a variety you know stuff that Clay Blair, Blair wrote, etc. But it's no matter whose account you're reading, you're going to find something that might contradict it, mm -hmm. something that something that doesn't add clarification. Because I've been reading this stuff since high school, and I've been reading it seriously for a few years now. And I'll be honest, it's still just the fact that the 507th wound up doing what it was doing at Lafayette on a five, what was you know a, a 505th D-Day objective, like the idea was that that much combat power was concentrated, was drawn to that location. I kind of get it because it was key terrain and you, you had to be able to prevent the Germans from attacking, you know, across the river. But it just kind of, the fact that Lafayette acted like a magnet and just everybody kind of just sat, kind of started moving in that direction is, I, it's still lost on me whether it was that because Kokanee was a 507th objective and that was the, the, okay, we can cross here to get to the objective or was it more a matter of, this is where the bulk of the division's combat power is assembling. So we're just gonna go where we can get, get a breather and reorganize before we move out to our objectives. The fact that so many different regiments wound up around that little manor and at that little crossing just defies imagination still. And I don't quite understand why everybody was just 
laser focused on that one piece of terrain when the objectives were so much broader. Right, right. It's, it especially interests me the way that 507, 507 object, objectives suddenly became the division's objectives because of this crazy sequence of events that emerges um, during the afternoon on June 6th. And that's the big attack from the, um, what is it, 100th Tank Training Replacement Battalion. That's the German Armored Battalion that comes down from Onfreville and yes. attacks into it. Because what you might be aware of is that 505 was supposed to take Lafayette Manor, 507 takes Cook, and you're securing both ends of the causeway. And the way that the battle ends up emerging is that, you know, there's an enormous delay in rooting out these, I think it was 23 Germans at Lafayette Manor that put up a fight like it was 123 Germans. And that slows it down significantly. And basically all three regiments get in on that action. And then as soon as that has ended, the, the G Company commander in 507th, which was, um, which was Captain Schwartzwalder, who would ultimately go on to coach, well, um, what was it? Syracuse, wasn't it? Syracuse to national championship in 1959. So coach, because so I keep calling him coach Schwartzwalder because that's what they all called him. But um, Schwartzwalder, after they have secured Lafayette, he takes a force directly across the causeway. And when they pass through, they reach Coquigny. And there was already a force present at Coquigny under two 507th lieutenants named Levy and Cormillo. And when he gets there, um, they, have, they have done their job and, and taken that objective and they're holding it. But Schwartzwalder, when he passes through, he takes their 1919 machine gun and I think he takes a BAR gunner and he moves on because Schwartzwalder realizes I am on the wrong side of the river. I, so as soon as Lafayette is straightened out, Schwartzwalder is marching to the objective. He's marching toward the drop zone because he's thinking regimental supply assembly area is going to be up there. The regimental headquarters is going to be up there. I, I, my battalion headquarters is going to be up. I need to be up there. And that's why he hastily moves what he assembled of G Company across the causeway through Coquigny and then keeps moving after taking some of the firepower away. And that leaves Coquigny underserved. Which is why then, when in the afternoon you get um, 900 Panzer Ausbildungs and it's a and it carries out this attack and it just rolls over them. And so they lose Cooking Yi in the afternoon. And I believe that's why you suddenly see Gavin go, uh oh, we've lost that. And if they get through Lafayette, there's, you know, the terrain. What's between yes, Lafayette and St. Mary Glees? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and he realized, like, I, I, I can't lose that. Uh, so Gavin begins to push units toward there just to plug the flooding. And what I, I'm continually fascinated by the fact that that's in the middle of this broader emerging picture of threats to the division that I am frequently guilty of not imagining. I'm frequently guilty of just focusing on 507th and what they endured and what they did. And I forget that there was things were not safe and secure. Like a criticism I frequently like to voice up about uh, in Band of Brothers is that episode two sort of leaves you with like, and all was right with the world. And <laughs> at, by the end of the day, by sunset on June 6th, all was not right with the world. The, the 82nd Division was in a, an extremely vulnerable position, as was clearly demonstrated by the meaningful attacks that descend on it during the day on June 7th, specifically the attack that comes from the north and comes down the N13 highway, and that leads to the um, H Company 505 and the John Ashley Distinguished Service Cross action with the anti-tank gun and the um, the Stugs that he knocks out. Um, and that, Paul Wood has just did a great discussion of that engagement, by the way. You saw, yeah, you saw Paul and Nils talk about that, and Nils is the he is the most knowledgeable um, he is the most knowledgeable person on the subject currently living. That's which, awesome. which is why he is, he's a resource that we can't live without anymore. I constantly go begging to him for things. And he's an extremely approachable historian, which is what also historians should be, I think. And he's, <laughs> he, he couldn't be more thorough in his research and he's great. And you saw what the two of them did as it related to the Ashley Distinguished Service Cross Action and everything that happened there. And a point that Paul and Nils brought up in that discussion was that, well, um, what if? That's all you got to do is throw what if into that action. What if the Stugs got through? What the hell happens to the 82nd Airborne Division if German armor, although I realize they're assault guns and not tanks, but what if German assault guns overran the division command post on June 7th? How does, how does the Normandy campaign look different if that happens? And that damn near happened. 
And by that same token, what if when the 100th Tank Training and Replacement Battalion came through, rolled through Cockigny, rolled them up at Cockigny, crossed the causeway and reached Lafayette, what if they had managed to power through the 505 at Lafayette? In other words, what if this, and, and then that also brings up, what if uh, Nouvelle au plan? What if the Germans had prevailed there? These threats to the 82nd Airborne Division, all of which turned to nothing, all of them could have been fatal. Yes, sir. And, and if that had happened, I think we, I certainly do not think we capture Cherbourg on June 25th. No, sir. And if we don't I mean, capture Cherbourg on June 25th, are we, are we, are we across the peninsula on June 15th? I don't think so. Are we in Carantan on June 11th? I don't think so. June 12th. Um, and so we could look at a, a, a course of battle that, that meaningfully differs from what ultimately happened, but for these narrow, you know, brushes with faith, with fate at um, just on the north side of St. Marigolese at nouvelle au -Plain, and then at Lafayette. And it fascinates me to this day that the 507th plays this instrumental part in the Lafayette chapter of that story through what? Through three rabulous composite companies that were thrown <laughs> together by the regiment that had the worst missed drop on D-Day. And, and there it is. That's that's the story behind the story. And it, it's it's ju just absolutely amazing. So we were coming up on the end of my time. I was hoping we might be able to get to talk a little bit about once the 507th wound up in the, the 17th, they even wore my 17th Airborne Division t-shirt today. Nice, very nice. You know, I love it. But, the, <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I did want to address really quickly because we were talking about Colonel Millet gets captured, Edson Raff takes over. Oh, a yeah, lot of folks know... A lot of folks know Edson Raff, 509th guy, jump into Operation Torch, you know, Mr. Airborne. It's my understanding, not uh, General Ridgway's favorite officer. So, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming, because I know Raff came in and commanded the Seaborne element. They kind of just kind of gave him a job. It, it had to be done. So was it really just a matter of, okay, here's a guy who's commanded in combat. We've lost a regimental commander. Give it to Raff. Like, how did Raff wind up in command of this of this regiment because he he took it to great heights both in uh you know bastogne and certainly on the jump across the rhine i, I think it was you know a fantastic uh, well, achievement think, as a combat commander i think you just described it beautifully in that um, it literally was uh raf was known specifically for being extremely dislikable and um and although that shouldn't be a factor if you were in the army you know it's a factor Yes, sir. And, and I, I think that this is why they ultimately complete the composed task force RAF. Task force RAF was there to perform a, an important function. As you know, it really didn't live up to exactly what it was. And that was supposed to be the fast moving, the rapid moving task force that lands with the Seaborne Echelon and races to establish the link up between Seaborne and Amphibious Echelon and the Airborne Airhead. And um, you know, as you know, they get stopped south, May south of St. Marigolese before sunset on June 6th. And suddenly job opportunity, their 507th is being commanded and being commanded quite ably by Arthur Maloney, who was not in the right pay grade. And, and Colonel Maloney, although he did a great job, Colonel Maloney also then manages to get himself shot up a little bit in July to the extent that he returns um, stateside to recuperate and during that time, decisions get made, and Edson Raff becomes the commander of the 507th and will command the regiment for the duration of the war. Very cool. I, I, I appreciate you adding that, that level of clarification because I always, always wonder just a little bit how somebody, as you said, who was so immensely dislikable was able to, to get himself a, a second chance, as it were. So, and you know, it's fun too. Uh, you, you, a few minutes ago, you um, opened up about the point at which everything becomes impossible boredom, and that is discussions of historiography. And <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned the difficulties that you've experienced, that I've experienced too, of bringing the different elements of the historiography, the different works that, that address this subject, bringing them into full reconciliation. They often will not harmonize with one another. And certainly, um, one book that I would mention is. SLA Marshall's Night Drop, which is a book that's got a lot of problems. Um, but then again, I think almost all of these books do. But Night Drop has a lot of problems. And the fun thing is that a close read of Night Drop, for me, 20 years ago, a lot of stuff went over my head. 
but I opened it up and reread it again. Thank you, COVID-19. And <laughs> I reread it. Um, I caught all this like catty stuff of all this, um, all this like you know, palace intrigue dislike of, well, you could tell who Marshall liked and you could tell who Marshall wanted to talk to and you could tell how Marshall favored stories to the neglect of other stories, the way that ultimately Cornelius Ryan would favor stories and neglect stories, the way that Stephen Ambrose would favor and then neglect, the way that all of that happened and the way that all of that, and those are, um, th those are the, the whims and the cavalier um, actions of people who end up controlling the story. I mean, and I am even guilty of that because there were veterans that I dealt with some of when I wrote the book that some of which I didn't like and they didn't get favored and some of which really opened up to me, were very accessible to me, were very warm and very modest. And they exhibited these characteristics that I found admirable and, my, and they therefore created gravity that drew me in. Um, and that, that affected the narrative. So I have to admit that, you know, I was... I was drawn in by there. There were guys that were just impossibly charming, and they, they were always ready to talk and ready to chat. And then there were guys that were kind of unapproachable, and the result was they ended up not really being a part of the book, which is something that Ambrose did, and Cornelius Ryan did, and S.L.A. Marshall did. And it, it's fascinating to me that the historiography becomes the the authors end up becoming a part of the historiography in a way. Sure. Um, but like just one person, like. One great thing about the 507th was I met so many guys that were just the biggest gentlemen. Um, th there's a negative chapter to my my experience in writing about World War II history and that I have in, specifically during the last 15 years, I've dealt with a large number of people that deliberately exaggerated and faked their history and um, lied about what they had done. And it was a very, very negative chapter and it turned me into a little bit of a cynic and it turned me into somebody that exposes everyone now to Cartesian um, uh, skepticism where I'm kind of like, you're gonna have to prove yourself to me. Um, and while that has certainly been something that has characterized my career since that book came out, I have to point out that when I wrote that book, I had the honor of being around um, men who basically gave me faith in the concept of the greatest generation who gave me um, men that I could look up to and that I could admire. And as I've already explained earlier in the show, I just stumbled into the 507th. I didn't go there looking for people like, for example, the regimental supply officer was a man named Gordon Smith, who ultimately became the, um, the uh, he led the ROTC program at LSU, which put him an hour up the road from me. And I spent a great deal of time with Colonel Smith and that's one of the greatest gentlemen I've ever been around in my life. He couldn't have been more open and hospitable and sharing to me. And I had this overwhelmingly positive experience in spending time with him and around him. And there were a lot of men like that from this little weird, unexpected episode in my life where I came within the orbit of the 507th. And I found a lot of guys there. I found the great majority of them were people that um, were certainly worthy of every, bound, every bit of respect that I could give them. And they lived up to the principles of the greatest generation in every way. Well, that's absolutely outstanding. And I, I for one, am grateful that you lived close enough to the museum that you had to go in on a Sunday and meet these gentlemen. So that's fantastic. <laughs> so, it almost didn't happen, strangely. So if anybody wants to learn more about Gordon K. Smith and his comrades in the, the 507th, uh, again, the book is down to earth. 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment in Normandy. It is on the secondary market. You might have to Google a little bit to find it, but if you can't find it, it's well worth the read. Marty, thank you so much for being on the show. I really learned a lot. I had a great time and I, I can't thank you enough. Well, Ben, thank you for the invitation to be on the show and thank you for giving me uh, an excuse to shave. <laughs> Fantastic. You take care, sir. You too. Bye now.